This week's episode is in partnership with Intact Insurance, here for you and for everything you care about. Well, hello, everybody. It's me, Jan. This is a very special Jan Arden podcast coming to you today from my home in Rocky View County in southern Alberta. I live on 14 acres, about 45 minutes west of the city of Calgary. And I have lived in this particular spot for about 15 years. Um, My music career kind of had me moving all over the place for a long time. The last 30 years have been, if nothing else, unbelievably interesting and filled with so much motion and change and hecticness and constant traveling, getting on planes, trains, taxis, by foot. Um, We used to make a joke that some of the gigs we did, we knew they were very far away from reality because the planes kept getting smaller. We'd start on a commercial flight that went to a smaller commercial flight that went to a small island hopping plane, a pontoon plane that landed on water, and we would always think to ourselves, this is going to be a good gig because it's kind of taking us off the grid. Anyway, yes, I'm coming to you today. It is no secret that the whole of the world is in a state that hasn't been seen by us, for sure. Us people born in the last 60, even 70 years. Um, We heard our parents speak about the hardships of the 40s with the Second World War, and certainly our grandparents talking to us about the peril and the endless challenges of the First World War. So not only did the globe suffer from one of the worst wars in modern history for five years, six years, then they were hit with, you know, one of the biggest plagues to uh, hit the entire globe estimating the deaths of between 50 and 100 million people from the Spanish flu. So we really haven't seen anything like that, certainly in my lifetime, and I'll be 58 years old next week. So these are interesting times, and for me, I'm sure like many of you, it has caused me to stop, because we have to stop. We have to stay home, and we have to stay in, and We have to social distance ourselves. I guess that's going to be the catchphrase of 2020 is social distancing and what that means to each of us individually, what that means to us as a society. What I wanted to do today is read you some poems that really have affected my life. I want to talk to you a little bit about how I even ended up being in the music business to begin with because I don't think it's a story that a lot of people know. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about my my grandmothers and sort of where they came from and, and who they were. Um, but yeah, I just want to spend some time together with you and and uh, if if anything... I hope to lift your spirits today and to give you a little glimpse into what's going on in my world here. I think connection has never been more important than it is right now. I want to read you this poem. Get some of this stuff out of my way here. I want to read you this poem by a woman named Peggy Friedberg. And uh, Peggy was a brilliant poet, but she came to it quite late in her life. 
and I'm talking very late in life. Uh, in fact, she died, um, I think she actually saw a draft of the book that I'm about to read from. This is called Poems from the Pond. Uh, Peggy Friedberg was 107 years old when she passed away. So she indeed lived a very, very long life. And like I said, she passed away just before uh, this poem, I think, went out into the public world. But she did see a draft of it. My friend Janice gave me this book several years ago. And uh, I remember Janice telling me about Peggy and just how much this poetry book had affected her and made her think about life. And especially when, when you think about this poem that I'm about to read to you being written by a woman who has been on the planet over 100 years. So without further ado, this is called Chorus of Cells. Peggy probably wrote this when she was 105. <laughs> wow. Okay. Chorus of Cells by Peggy Friedberg. Every morning, even being very old, or perhaps because of it, I like to make my bed. In fact, the starting of each day, unhelplessly, is the biggest thing I ever do. I smooth away the dreams disclosed by tangled sheets. I smack the dented pillows, revelations to oblivion. I finish with the pattern of the spread exactly centered. The night is one, and now the day can open. All this I like to do, mastering the making of my bed, with hands that trust beginnings. All this I need to do, directed by the silent message of the luxury of my breathing. And every night, I like to fold the covers back and get into bed and live the dark, wise poetry of the night's dreaming, dreading the extent of its improbabilities, but surrendering to the truth it knows and I do not even though its technicolor cruelties or the music of its myths feels like someone else's experience, not mine. I know that I could no more cease to want to make my bed each morning than fold the covers back at night than I could cease to want to put one foot before the other. Being very old and so because of it, all this I am compelled to do day after day, night after night, directed by the silent message of the constancy of my breathing that bears the news I am alive. Chorus of Cells by Peggy Friedberg. I love the line, and every night I like to fold the covers back and get into bed. This is a woman... 105, 106 years old writing this. And where I live, I, my life is so hectic, but when I come out here to Rocky View County, it's the antithesis of what my life usually looks like. Like right now, although you may not be able to hear it, there are squirrels yattering out there madly. And they drive my little dog, Mitty, crazy. Anyway, if you have a chance to get poems from the pond, 107 years of words of wisdom by Peggy Friedberg, I so recommend this book. I mean, I could literally open it to any page. I'm going to read one more to you just because I can. This is called Attitudes. Why do I go on and on about the heart grief of old widows? Why must I kneel with all the other black shawled ancients who beat their hands against that wailing wall and wallow in its communal dark drowning? Why do I describe so piteously to you the popcorn solitude of an old woman's aloneness in a movie on a Sunday afternoon? and the disappointment of lilacs, 
and that dawn and spring are harder to believe in. What is left, I mourn, besides my blood that flows imperfectly through faithful arteries, sift through the wreckage of myself that cannot be rebuilt, rake through the bones and dust of empty rooms to see if there is something still alive in there that once belonged to me. I hope I have that kind of wisdom when I'm 105 years old. My mother always told me that it was important to have a purposeful life. And for those of you that know me somewhat, uh, you would know that my mother suffered from Alzheimer's for a decade. Uh, At 72 years old, we knew something was going sideways, but we just, uh, well, me certainly, I wasn't at all prepared to accept what it was. But I think my mother's message to me throughout her illness, and she lived with Alzheimer's for 10 years, passed away at 82, was to have a purposeful life. I feel a little bit guilty about it now that I look back, but I had lots and lots of laughs with mom. I want something to do. I need something to do. And (laughs) so inevitably, I would give her a mop and a pail, and I would just sort of set her in the middle of my living room. I've got a lot of hardwood floors in my house. And she was like a human Roomba. She just went around and, and she mopped. And literally, once in a while, I would find her in a corner, kind of bumping against like a, the wall or the, the sideboard. And I would literally kind of gently grab her shoulders and turn her around and set her back towards the living room. Anyway, seeing as that we are all in uh, some type of self-isolation, in quarantine, uh, stuck somewhere in Mexico or trying to get home from somewhere, I just thought that I would do this, this special edition of the podcast today and just spend a little bit of time with all of you. Um, good things come out of bad things. And that is a message that I absolutely want to convey to each and every individual out there. Bad things come from good things. Any of us that have the opportunity, which we absolutely do right now, to look back at the trajectory of our lives, we can see the fault lines. We can see the hills that we climbed more clearly. We can see the obstacles. We can see the breaking points. But we can also see those triumphs and those successes and the wins that don't seem to come often enough. But as we look back, we can see why they happened. And usually they happen because something bad, something dreaded, some horrible doubt has led us into a place of enlightenment and a place of positivity and a place where we have experienced the most growth. I am in the music business and I'm a singer today because my, my dad was an alcoholic. He was a raging alcoholic. And when I was younger, I knew something was wrong, but obviously did not have the emotional wherewithal. I wasn't mature enough or grown up enough or old enough to recognize and understand what was going on. That was the silent burden of my mother, which I understand so much more clearly now. My dad was a hard worker. You know, he was always a very good provider. He was extremely talented. He um, left home when he was 15 years old and ended up working in northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan on a seismic crew. So they were... Basically, these young guys. Uh, My dad worked with guys that were in their 20s, which 
they were incredibly young, but they were considered the old guys on this crew. But, you know, my dad was 15 years old and up there with all these old guys. He has some horrific stories of, you know, just being up there on these seismic crews, basically looking for rock figure configurations that would point towards petroleum. This is sort of what my idea of what he did was. I think I think the end game was definitely looking for oil and where to drill for it. Anyway, my dad said that these guys were, you know, obviously so young themselves, but he said, Jan, you know, when I started drinking, he said we'd we'd have a, a 40 ounce bottle of some kind of cheap whiskey and our mixer was a big jug of wine like a two gallon jug of wine he said that's what we mix the whiskey with so can you even fathom how friggin hammered these guys were like how drunk they were so I think my dad's introduction into the world of alcohol and I'm not saying this happens to everybody because obviously it doesn't but for him it set him on a path that just wasn't good um, for whatever reason and my dad was raised in a Mormon family like I I come from a really really long line of Mormon people and even I'm like baffled by that when I think about it my dad's mother Krilla that's an interesting name, C-R-I-L-L-A. Krilla, Allison, came up in a covered wagon from Salt Lake. And everybody knows, you know, the Mormon stories from Salt Lake City. Uh, when you think of Salt Lake and you think of Utah, you think of, you know, the Mormons being there with the big temple. And Anyway, they, um, the government was offering land, free land or very, very cheap land, back at the turn of the century, and they, they came up in the late 1800s from uh, Utah on a covered wagon. Can you imagine taking that trip? I just don't even know. I mean, in comparatively, when I think about myself sitting here and feeling quite sorry for myself that I'm, you know, st staying in the house and canceling all these jobs, and, you know, we're all feeling very hard done by right now. You don't really have to think too long and hard about someone. And my grandmother was very young, too. She would have been a young girl coming up. Um, <laughs> and they settled in Cardston in southern Alberta. And my great-grandfather was one of the gentlemen that was involved in building the Mormon temple in Cardston. So, yes, long Mormon history. But I digress. Good things come out of bad things. And because my dad was an alcoholic... I knew, even at 10, 11 years old, to cut a wide swath around him. And so I ended up spending a lot of time in my parents' basement. You know, dingy, no windows. Basements were basements back in the days. They weren't like walkouts now. I remember there was like one bald, lonely light bulb in the middle of the room with a long string on it. And you'd run down there and swing your arms around trying to touch some small part of that string so that you could pull it and, and turn some light on. There was indoor-outdoor carpeting down there, uh, concrete walls that always smelled wet and musty. There was a, a definite smell in my parents' basement that was unmistakable. But I would go down there and I'd play records. The old record player was down there and um, it was such a crap record player. And I remember the needle was so worn out that it had, uh, we, we had taped pennies onto the arm to keep the needle on the actual vinyl. Anyway, my brothers and I caught my dad at just the right state of drunkenness. And we talked him into letting us join the Columbia Record Club. For one cent, you could get 10 LP records. So you all remember the Columbia Record Club. But from that, you know, very humble beginning, I started playing my mom's, my mom had an old guitar that was sitting in the corner and I would listen to records and 
strum away on this guitar and literally I have not looked back since that moment. So good things come from bad things. Hi, it's Jan Arden. You're listening to the Jan Arden Podcast. This is our special edition coming to you live from my kitchen counter uh, in Rocky View County. We were talking about uh, good things coming from bad things. And indeed they do. So I was telling you about uh, my dad being an alcoholic and that being the main reason that I went into the music business. I would never, I I don't think it would ever have crossed my mind to have considered music. It just, it wasn't on my radar. I mean, I was very, very young. I hadn't even begun to consider what my career was going to be. Uh, we lived in the country. I should preface this whole story by saying that there was no corner store that I could run to. The kids were miles away from me. I took uh, the big yellow, <clears throat> excuse me, school bus, you know, out to Springbank uh, Elementary and the high school and the junior high. So, you know, that was that was like an hour every morning and every night coming home. So there wasn't anywhere for me to go. So I really was ironically kind of isolated even back then uh, as a young girl. But it's amazing to me just spending that time with music in the basement and how magic music is, how magical it is. Um, I just, I was, I had a crush on music from the very get-go. And I remember listening to one of my Columbia Record Club records, and it was Janice Ian. And you know the drill. I mean, I know you guys all remember the Columbia Record Club. You, for, for your one penny, you'd get your 10 albums sent to you. And then every month after that, the Columbia Record Club would send you a record of their choice. So, you know, you got 12 LPs every year that you'd never heard of. But I was so grateful for that because I got so many cool records that you know, as a 10 or 11 year old, I would never have found at the co-op because that was the only store that we had was the co-op. And that was about 40 minutes away from us. Anyway, I remember listening to the Janicean record called Society's Child. And one of the first things that attracted me about music was that people... It dawned on me that somebody had to write the music that I was listening to. And that was a real epiphany. I was, like, I I couldn't get my, my young mind around the fact that a human being sat down and, and constructed these pieces of music. And that was fascinating to me. And I think At that moment, that very moment that it dawned on me that that idea went into my head that someone wrote the music, it's it's what I wanted to do. And I never wavered from that. Anyway, Janice Ian had written a song called At Seventeen. And I think she was very young when she wrote it. I think she was younger than 17, or she may have been 17. I learned the truth at 17 that love was meant for beauty queens and high school girls with clear skin smiles who married young and then retired. The brown-eyed girls I never knew, the Friday night charades of youth, were spent on ones more beautiful. At 17, I learned the truth. Oh, but those of us with ravaged faces Lacking in the social graces, desperately remained at home, inventing lovers on the phone who called to say, come dance with me, murmur vague obscenities, it isn't all it seems at 17. Imagine a young teenager writing those words about the angst, of youth, I mean, such a, a, a the quintessential coming of age song. And I remember playing that over and over and over again. It was one of the very first songs that I taught myself on my mother's guitar. 
my fingers bled literally. I'm not just making up some dramatic tale. It frustrated me because I wanted to keep playing so much. Like, you know, you play for six hours steady. I couldn't, I mean, to this day, I can't feel the ends of my left-hand fingers. They're just, after... 48 years of playing the guitar, I, I can't feel the ends of my left hand, of my fingers. I think for me, hearing somebody sing those words, it, I was just like, you can write down whatever, whatever you want in a song. You can say whatever you want in a song. And I was fascinated by that, and I could not start writing songs soon enough. Uh... I think I was 11 when I composed my very first song. And I just, I mean, I wrote terrible songs. I don't even think I could really sing much at all. But I just, I mean, I often wonder, had what would my life had looked like had my dad not been a drinker? And that's, that's what's so hard to come to terms with is, you know, we, we think about having free will and we think about making choices in our life. But then there's also this external stuff that's at work constantly in our existences. Stuff that happens that pushes us into a direction. And you wonder, is that really deliberate? Like, was that the absolute design for me? Um, but my experience in my entire career has always been exactly that, that good things come out of bad things. I was in my parents' basement for the next six or seven years, playing songs, learning how to play songs, listening to records. I couldn't get home from school fast enough to go down into that basement. And above me, a storm raged. Uh, My brother was three years older than me, and he, you know, I think much... (laughs) To his own demise, he wanted to please my dad all the time. He wanted to connect with him. He wanted to, you know, have my dad see him and recognize him and be proud of him. And my dad was the kind of drunk, he was just looking for a fight, and my older brother got the brunt of it. And I feel so bad for that. But imagine this, um, you know, just this young guy... 13, 14 years old, just having the ever-loving crap beat out of him. Um, I'm going to talk more about my brother as we go along today. But, um, yeah, we, we had very, very different paths that we took. And my younger brother, a much different path as well. Patrick was five years younger than me and eight years younger than my brother, Dre. But, yeah, we're sitting here. This is a very special edition of the Jan Arden podcast. And I'm Jan, of course, sitting in the trees. And uh, we are going to be right back. So hope you'll hang out with me today. We're all in our quarantines, in our, in our self-imposed castles, in the turrets. We can't even dangle our hair down, guys. We can't even dangle our hair down to let somebody climb up. Um, yeah, these are strange times. I've been talking a little bit about my family and uh, a lot about good things coming from bad things. And that is the absolute truth. I, um, yeah, I spent the next seven years in my parents' basement writing songs, learning how to write songs. I wrote hundreds of really, really terrible songs. And once in a while I'd write something that I really loved and really thought was okay. Uh, The interesting thing for me in all of this is that I was very, very secretive about it. I was a funny kid. I always had a really great sense of humor. And I was the class clown. I was like a complete jackass. Uh, The school that I went to on the yellow school bus out to Springbank was incredibly small. Uh, The community that I'm in now has changed a lot over the last 40 years. But when I was going to school out there, uh, like there was 40 kids in my whole class. There was 42 of us actually. And those are the kids that I went all through the grades with, like all the grades, junior high, senior high. 
uh, anyone new that came in to the equation was uh, very, very studied and eyeballed and critiqued and eventually very, very welcomed into the fold. So, but I think we were so fascinated with anyone new that came on the scene. It probably was quite the experience for those people to happen upon our school and, and, and my classmates. Anyway, when I graduated at 18 years old, at my graduation, I had written a song, obviously secretly in my parents' basement, to play to my classmates. And so I, um, I got up and played a song for them. And my mom and dad cried because my mom said, I didn't even know you liked music. I had no idea what you were doing in that basement, <laughs> which always makes me laugh. But she, uh, they were shocked. And I think I understand it because my mom felt like, I mean, obviously she had a lot of crap going on with my dad. It was like a nonstop battering ram on her heart and mind. But I think she felt like she didn't know who I was. And I'm sure it hurt her. I mean, I remember getting my period at 16 years old. And I didn't tell her. I didn't talk to her. I didn't have that kind of relationship with my mom. And as I got older, my mom and I were like so, so very close. But I think back to that, I just relied on my girlfriends. We obviously didn't have the internet to tap into to go, what is a period and how do you do it? What do you do? Um, we just, I just asked my pals. But anyway, yeah, my mom and I were just at different ends of the pool. I think she was trying to keep her head above water and keep the peace. Um, at one point before I was 18, she kicked my dad out for a while. He was gone for about three months and then he came back. So it was a tumultuous, my teenage years were really tumultuous. My older brother, you know, was in constant battles with dad. He left, he must have been 15, I think, when he left home. Which is heartbreaking. No 15-year-old should be out there wandering around, but that's just what happened. It was, it was sad. It really was. But I sang the song at the graduation, and then, you know, I was hooked at this point by music. But I really didn't think for a second that somebody that looked like me, that came from Spring Bank, Alberta, could even consider for a second being in the music business. I just, I just didn't think that's what people look like. You know, the pop stars to me back in my day were Carly Simon and Bette Midler and Olivia Newton-John was racing up the charts. And, of course, there was Streisand and James Taylor and Anne Marie and, you know, all these people that looked so polished. And I just didn't think I fit in to that at all. But I was hooked. Uh, graduated high school. Did not know what to do. Um, I had kind of started drinking myself back in the day, but just, you know, big parties with pals. But I don't ever remember being a person that could control alcohol. I, even at high school parties, I would just drink until I fell over. I was like a bowling pin. Hard to look back at that kind of history. But that's what it was for me. I don't know if it was what I saw. I don't know if it's genetics. I don't know if it's like a combination of all those things. I briefly went to college and took theater arts. My dad was furious. I didn't pay goddamn all that money for you to goddamn, you know, act like a mushroom or fall backwards off a stage. I made a mistake one day of coming home from Mount Royal College and telling him that our class, 
my drama class, I had enlisted in drama, enrolled rather in drama, had uh, you know done these trust exercises and fallen backwards off of a stage into the arms of you know twenty of your classmates. And he just he just was furious. He was furious. Long story short, I ended up dropping out of college. Um, things were miserable at the house. My mom was working full time at a dentist office, but um, I just wanted to get out of there. I was a singing waitress at a place called Orlando's Bistro for a while. And uh, anyway, I just had an opportunity. A friend of mine that I had met outside of school, outside of high school, had a an apartment in Vancouver. And she just said, I have an extra bedroom and it's like $200 a month and you can stay there. And so when I went out to Vancouver and and... It was just a horrible time out there. I drank even more. I was busking on the streets, singing original songs and um, getting nowhere. But I wasn't really trying. I wasn't focused on anything. I just was... I don't know if I was traumatized. I don't know if I was just thinking that life was just suddenly going to present me with all these opportunities. I just wasn't thinking at all. I, um, anyways, I was living with my friend and I was busking and, and doing all that. And I would sing long enough to have 10 bucks in my case. And then I would go buy a couple of bottles of cheap wine. And by cheap wine, I mean like $2 a bottle. Screw, screw cap. When screw cap wasn't cool. Now uh, screw cap's all the rage, right? But uh, back then it was certainly the sign of a low quality, very new vintage of wine. But I would do that. I would buy some cigarettes and I would just go and drink that and smoke cigarettes and just think the world was going to unfold for me. And I didn't even, who knows? Anyway, uh, on one of my many busking adventures in downtown Vancouver, I was just starting and I had about $4 in my case and somebody slugged me, knocked me out, took the money out of my case. I woke up with my guitar clutched in my hands and um, I just was glad that they didn't steal my guitar. I'm still not sure why they didn't steal my guitar. It was quite a nice guitar. It was, it was a Washburn and it took me like five years to pay it off. I made monthly payments of $9, if you can believe that. Anyway, we're talking today about good things coming from bad things, and they do. It's times like these that really test your character. They test your everything, your, your entire immune system, your, your mental health, your ability to keep anxiety at bay. I don't know about you guys, but that to me is the biggest challenge. Um, I do live in a rural area. I'm out here with my little dog. I'm single, so I'm on my own. My neighbors have been awesome. They've all been checking in and hanging out, and I've absolutely been FaceTiming with everybody. Um, I've got a texting thread with like six of my friends. We say good morning. We say good night. Um, I can't imagine how challenging it is keeping your kids occupied and, and, um, but yeah, what a time to slow down and, and just think. And I'm just seeing a lot of good things coming out of a lot of bad things. I'm so touched by how people are being towards each other. Um, and this is global. This isn't something that's just happening in a 100-mile radius. I think this virus, as mischievous and evil and as wicked as it can be, is doing unprecedented things with humanity and with the planet. The things that we've seen happen in the last three weeks with pollution, with garbage, the clarity of the ocean waters... Um, for the first time in 50 years, there was a fellow saying on the news that uh, he'd lived in Venice his whole life and hadn't seen the bottom of the canal since he was 18. And he could see 
the clear water in just like three or four weeks. Good things come out of bad things. And if anything, the planet is showing us that if she is given a moment to come up for air, I almost liken it to us as humanity, nine billion of us, holding the Earth's head underwater. And the Earth trying to come up and trying to come up for a breath of air. And all of us just holding it down. And so this last three months... And as this escalates into more of us staying home and more of us staying, you know, out of our jobs and away from concerts and all the stuff that we do, most of the time very mindlessly, I might add, all the tasks that we do to busy ourselves, because God forbid we should think for a second, the earth's head has popped up and taken a breath and had a reprieve. Good things come out of bad things. And we're seeing that everywhere. We're seeing it in nature. And I think we're seeing it in each other. The singing on the balconies of the Italians and the French people and uh, the sense of community and the sense of togetherness, I think will really change us going forward. I do not personally see how humanity will go back to the way we were. I think we will change. Good things come out of bad things. Um, when I got slugged out in Gastown playing my guitar, I ended up, you know, obviously scared, and I didn't want to do it anymore. And there was a part of me that just thought, oh, you can never make it in the music business. God, don't be an idiot. I sort of licked my wounds and put my guitar in its case, and I didn't want to tell my parents I, I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to just not tell anybody what had happened. I saw a sign in uh, Lonsdale Key that said deckhand required no experience necessary. So I ended up working on a salmon trawler for like a month. And, uh, you know, I'd been, like I said, I was doing a lot of drinking and smoking cigarettes and just being, just being mindless. But I ended up on Norman Earl's fishing boat in the Pacific Ocean, fishing for salmon. We were out there for a month. But I sobered up, so I was just 20 years old. And uh, for that month, I didn't drink anything. He certainly had beer on the boat, but I didn't want to. It's one good thing I'll say about fresh ocean air. And he'd get me up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I would, you know, open up a bunch of tin cans. That was my idea of cooking and breakfast, and we just ended up fishing and it was a big trawler boat so here's this 75 year old guy on a salmon trawler working all the lines and pulling the fish in and I was gutting four or five hundred salmon a day anyway it kind of rebooted me I came back from that fishing trip I had 300 bucks in my pocket which wasn't a lot but it seemed like a small fortune to me at that time but I ended up moving home my mom cut a little ad out of the newspaper because I, of course, had moved back in with my parents. Felt like the biggest loser in the world. I thought, you know, I'm going to go to Vancouver. I'm going to make it big. Make it big doing what? I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't helping myself. But she cut me this little ad out that was for a wedding singer job, a backup singer in a wedding band. Well, you'll just work on the weekends, and I think it'll be really fun for you, and it'll be nice, and you can go do that. And Anyways, I got the job. The piano player's name was Dave Hart. I worked in that band for, I don't know, four or five months. And then David, who was 20 years older than I was, so he would have been in his 40s, talked me into doing a lounge job. And it was the first time that I actually played some of my songs to somebody. I played him some of my original songs, and he just was mind-boggled. He's like, you got to start playing some of these songs in our, in our little duo. And so we did. I, you know, not a lot. I would play like two or three a night. But we eventually had a very eclectic following of people. We played the interior of BC. We played up in the Yukon. We played a lot in Alberta. We played out in Banff. We played downtown Calgary. And, you know, on a good night, we'd have 80 people sitting very quietly 
smoking cigarettes because you could smoke back then, and drinking. And I drank a lot, of course, again, because it was a lounge and people would buy me drinks. And uh, This guy started following me around named Neil. He followed me around for months, months. As I get older, my memory of it all becomes a little less clear, but nonetheless, he started following me around, and I'm sure he saw me so drunk singing sometimes and ended up leaving, but he said, when you were really great, you were so great. And uh, he said, I know those are your songs that you're playing. And uh, anyways, within a few months, I started working closely with Neil. And he said, you know, I... And he was a music guy. He'd worked with A&M Records. He'd worked with Katie Lang. Uh, previous to that, he'd worked a little bit with her. And he had some experience. And he just um, said, I think we can try hard to get a record deal. Anyway, I want to I wanna save time to tell this story. I've only got a few minutes left. But Neil and I tried for like five years. We were turned down by everybody constantly, constantly, constantly. Good things come out of bad things. He... Um, sent my tape to A&M Records. He knew somebody that could get my cassette to uh, the A&R guy there. A&R is artist and repertoire. Those are the guys that sign the actual bands. And he got my cassette to this guy named Alan Reed. Alan is the head of the Juno Committee now, but I worked with Alan for a long time. Anyway, long story short, um, Alan, you know, he got my cassette We'd been turned down 30 times. I didn't expect anything new to happen, but, you know, he listened to my cassette in Toronto in his car, and we were very hopeful, but, of course, the next day he called back and he said, mm, I don't know, it's just, it's not really what I'm looking for. You have to understand that in the early 90s, the entire music, the geography of music was grunge. It was the whole West Coast thing happening. It was Nirvana and... Alice in Chains, um, Pearl Jam. It was just all of that music. And Alan was 26 years old. He wanted to sign a band, a young grunge band. He didn't want to sign like a... At that time, I was just about to turn 30 years old. So you can imagine, that's pretty... That's, that's old in the music business now. Um, they, they groom women, especially so young, young women. I mean, look at someone like Billie Eilish. She's 18 years old. Anyway... Alan got the tape, he drove around, he listened to it. It was 10 songs that I had played acoustically with my guitar on this cassette because we had failed miserably with producing demos. We had done bands and we'd done all kinds of things and uh, we were just getting turned down. So we did, it, we did something really simple. Alan called Bruce, or sorry, Alan called Neil. Bruce is my present manager. Excuse the Freudian slip. And he just said, I'm not interested. I just don't know. I don't get it. It's not for me. Um, I'm sorry. I just can't do anything with Jan. And I, of course, was devastated. Neil was devastated. We really didn't know where to go from there. It had been five years, 25 to 30, that we'd been demoing, 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 failing, failing. And uh, so I was just, like, going to pack it in. I thought, this just isn't for me. I can't. And I was really thinking, what am I going to do? I've done this, and I imagine that time I'd been writing music for 20 years. I've been writing music since I was 10 years old. Anyway, good things come from bad things. Alan's girlfriend, fiance, whatever, broke up with him. And at 26 years old, he'd never had anything terrible happen to him in his life, really. And he was devastated. He took time off. He had to reboot. He had to recalibrate. He was extremely depressed. Took some time off. And when he came back to work and got into his car, guess whose cassette was still in his car? Mine. He got in his car, and the first song that came on was a song called I Just Don't Love You Anymore. And Alan pulled his car over or went to his office, whatever he did, and he called Neil and he said, listen, I don't know if Jan's ever going to sell a record in her life, but I get it. I get what she does. Good things come out of bad things. Whenever you're in the middle of your own crap, know that the universe has other things swirling around you and that there is so much positivity and that nothing is static. Bad things aren't static. They're just not static. I am here 
talking to you. I'm in the music business. Alan Reed signed me. I've been with A&M Records for 28 years. I've been with the same record company. That's all the time I have. Thanks for joining me on this special rambling podcast. Um, I wish you nothing but positivity and wellness. Please be of good cheer. Bad things are not static. We have survived for a couple of million years, folks, and we're going to continue to survive, and we're going to thrive. And um, I send lots of love your way. This is the Jan Arden Podcast. Join me again next Saturday to meet you.